box for asking quest questions or for hints and remarks. We will cherry pick some for our Q&A sessions. Our sessions will be recorded for archival reasons and to keep the option open to share the contributions with a broader audience. Obviously, this will only happen when we receive the consent from all our speakers. Furthermore, this is a conference for and by students, so please respect one another. Only for the speakers, only the speaker's exceptional, remarkable effort makes this happen. So welcome to this second session of Connext. Because we probably have some new audience members, here's just a very short introduction how Connext came into being and what we would like to achieve. Connects is a joint effort of the conservation pro training programs of the University of, of Antwerp, Amsterdam, Hildesheim, Cologne, Potsdam and Lincoln, all within the field of wood and furniture conservation. Some programs also incorporate polygamy and, and modern materials. Hence, the partners in Connects provide a wide variety of subjects. Our ambition is to connect you, the students, with your international student colleagues and to give you the opportunity to share your work and your questions. We know these are strange times and especially for you who had such different expectations of what your time at university, university would be like. In the last year, we all learned to communicate, communicate via digital tools. And this again makes it easier to share our knowledge on an inter-university and an international level. After only one year, it seems that we are more connected than ever. For this series of Connects Evenings, we have over 300 registered participants, all united from over 29 different educational and research institutes and from 12 different countries. That is beyond the great attendance and it's better than we ever expected. Education is paramount for the future of our field and it starts with sharing, <coughs> sharing your hard work, your experience, your experiences and your knowledge and connects tries to provide a platform for this exchange we also hope that aside from connects you will continue doing so in the rest of your studies and your professional life as the connects team we hope to lower the threshold for you to send in your work for conferences like those of icomcc ebonist or future talks so let Connects 2021 be the start of an international platform for young conservator restorers to meet and share your knowledge. Today only virtually, but better days are ahead and we'll get the chance to meet each other in person real soon. So now we think you are as excited as we are to kick off this second Connects session with the help of one of our of one of the many established keynote speakers who were so kind and eager to participate in this event. So let's connect. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, it's my honor uh, to introduce the today's keynote speaker, Mr. Adrian Smith. Adrian Smith is an acknowledged expert in the conservation of furniture. For more than 20 years, Adrian has been assistant to the master of the household, the royal household at Windsor Castle. So we all should be jealous because he probably knows a lot of old furniture and other artifacts from the magnificent and historic surroundings of the main residence of Her Majesty the Queen and the royal family. At uh, that given time, he was external examiner of the study programs at Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, Ireland, and later also at the University of Lincoln. Today, he is conserv conservation consultant for the Royal Collection Trust. The professional network uh, LinkedIn tells about the trust. We care for the Royal Collection, one of the world's greatest art collections and manage the public opening of the, of of the official residences of Her Majesty the Queen, Buckingham Palace with Sokas, of the house in Edinburgh, end of quotation. Adrian told me before that he will start with his story 50 years ago, so I don't want to be too wordy now. Adrian, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Sorry, I was just waiting for my machine to crank up. There we go. Okay. Right, good evening everyone. And thank you, uh, 
Andreas, for your, that uh, very grand introduction. I've been lucky in my career. Um, when I was asked to be a speaker at this online conference, uh, I was concerned that I might not have anything of value to say to the next generation of conservator restorers. I was also finding it hard to choose which of the potentially 118 elements to talk about. Thankfully, I was reassured that I might have something to say and it was suggested that I concentrate on the classical element, physical elements of earth, water, wind and fire. I suddenly felt more in my comfort zone. Um, the series title of Conservation by the Next Generation caused me to reflect upon my own generation of conservative restorers and the developments in knowledge and practice in the 50 years since I first picked up a woodworking tool to repair a piece of damaged antique furniture. So if you'll forgive me, I will start by recalling my beginnings in this field of work. Antique furniture restoration in those days was a fast developing trade, working at many different levels from the serious connoisseur collectors market to the following of uh, the followers of the hippie culture recycling inexpensive 19th century cottage furniture. My professional training um, in antique furniture restoration began in the early 1970s and unusually for that time at college. The first few years was an intense course in handcraft furniture design and traditional cabinet making with additional furniture restoration specialization uh, option. Ooh, that's it. Um, here's uh, just a little slide of saying uh, where we got to with the uh, handcraft furniture making. This was a um, cogged dovetail, uh, actually it's the plinth and the top moulding of a toolbox. Um, we were so uh, enthusiastic about the arts and crafts uh, that we even uh, added that sort of complexity into, uh, into making uh, uh, our toolboxes. Um, the course was very intense with full day taught lessons and evening lectures and some weekend activity as well. We learned about timber technology, stability of structures, engineering, modern materials, as well as design history and restoration technology. This, from this course, led on to an even more intense course in professional antique restoration at West Dean College. That's it, and here we are, <laughs> all those years ago. Um, uh, and uh, this was an even more intense, um, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, led on to an even more intense course in professional antique furniture restoration at West End College. This was the first course of its kind in England at that time. Uh, the West Dean College course was primarily focused on the requirements of the top end of the British antique furniture market, the London antiques trade, and indeed was uh, to some extent controlled by them. It was very well structured course for that time with social history, art history, history of furniture lectures, in addition to practical instruction and restoration practice overseeing by recognized experts of that time. There was much discussion and debate amongst the students about alternative approaches, ethics and integrity, not always high on the antique trades agenda of those days. Like with like and used but not abused were mantra dashed about with uh, like religious commandments. Analysis and research based on visible physical evidence was key to a uh, understanding what we were dealing with, be it age, condition, timber type, other materials, nationality, value, etc. This college training taught me many useful things, but not a great deal about the science behind the subject. That would come later in my career. Starting work in the commercial sector was a shock. <laughs> the trade was very secretive each restorer guarding their own special recipes 
and secrets of the trade. They would rather talk about football all day long than in the intricacies of, of chronological developments in furniture construction and design or new ways of doing things. You can imagine their response to enthusiastic questioning by the college boy. Their understanding, <laughs> their understanding of a tease chart would be who makes it, how strong, with or without milk, and how many sugars. <laughs> a periodic table uh, was one that looked like it belonged to a certain furniture history period, but they were not sure of its authenticity. Luckily, I had been taught some useful practical skills at college and was able to secure my place as an improver furniture restorer. During these early years, I experienced much false science and, because, and, and the comment, because we've always done it that way as an explanation for using certain processes rather than reasoned argument. I worked hard to develop my skills and knowledge further and moved workshop every two years as I arrogantly judged that the learning curve dropped off after that time. Working in three different workshops of high-end antique furniture restorers brought me to a level where I thought I was competent, a competent furniture restorer after nine years of learning and practice. I then wanted to put all the bit, best bits I had learned into my own restoration business. And indeed, with, uh, in, in um, cooperation with some dealers uh, in the Cotswolds, I did uh, set up and run uh, a specific restoration business. In fact, I never did stop learning and went on to add skills and knowledge of furniture, wood and conservation and teaching. Uh, it was, um, uh, I'm going to put that there. That's uh, an example of something that might have come into the, well, it did come into the workshop in front of my bench to sort out. Um, and uh, going back to the, the learning, it was a, uh, a revelation to me to discover that nature, the nature of everything, hard, soft, shiny, sticky, or whatever, was based on molecular bonding and their de degradation was usually a change or break in that bonding. Most of the good science I experienced in objects conservation came uh, to me from two sources. Archaeology, where it was imperative that fragile objects taken from the environment that had preserved them for millennia were protected from further degradation in their new environment. And paintings restoration, for the complex treatment of surfaces. Uh, the satin wood bookcase cabinet illustrated here required all of my skills and knowledge to clean it, consolidate what was there and replace what wasn't. The de very degraded surface required alkaline and chelate uh, cleaning processes as well as solvent removal of degraded uh, shellac base varnishes before traditional refinishing. Uh, that was how it turned out. Uh, the panels aren't actually uh, folded or pleated silk, they're actually trompe they are painted on wooden panels. Uh, some very careful cleaning not to uh, disrupt that surface. That brings me to the greatest experience of the elements in my working life to date, although in this case the classical elements were encountered in reverse of their usual order. Okay, come on. Oh, that's it. Right. Windsor Castle. Um, this is Windsor Castle, one of the de defensive forts built around London by William the Conqueror shortly after the Norman conquest of Britain in the 11th century and added to almost every century since. Um, it is now more a fortified royal palace than a military stronghold. Next slide. Um, fire. Uh, I said we'd take it in reverse order. On the 20th of November 1992, uh, a fire uh, started at Windsor Castle. It spread from the ceiling level of the 
royal uh, private chapel spreading out and destroying many of the magnificent state and semi-state rooms of the castle. It burned for 15 hours, reaching temperatures in some areas high enough to melt metal and glass. Um, so uh, you get these temperatures, anything organic was vaporized and many inorganics denatured beyond recovery. Wind, uh, the fire having taken hold in the northeastern corner of the building was fanned by a steady southwesterly wind that is the norm for uh, uh, Windsor. Apart from fueling the fire with oxygen, the wind assisted in blowing the fire towards and out of the northeastern corner of the building, which is what we're looking at here, away from even more priceless architecture. Um, the wind was to play a significant role in the restoration program. Uh, so here's the castle on the as it would have looked the day before the fire, and that's what happened to that northeastern section after. Uh, <laughs> water, one and a half million gallons or six and three quarter million litres of water was pumped into the building during the 15 hours of firefighting. A significant amount of this was absorbed into the building and any objects remaining in the debris. after the fire. Earth. Uh, during the fire and immediately afterwards, hundreds of tons of ash and rubble littered the floors of the destroyed interiors. Uh, this waterlogged rubble contained burnt wood, lime plaster, stone, sand, metal and glass, making it a dangerous cocktail for anything salvageable that lay beneath. No salvage operation could be attempted for some time until the remaining structure of the building could be made safe and stable. There were also hazards among the debris with the possibility of asbestos and large quantities of lead in all its forms from the roof. When salvage could take place, it was decided that in particularly sensitive areas as a uh, an archeological approach would be adopted with a grid system of removal of sifting to reclaim anything of value. This one. And here's the, uh, the bins arriving for sorting. Reclaimed items were sorted into type and spread out in ventilated plastic crates to dry under cover. Subsequent conservation of many of these items was to maintain physical evidence of the original interiors, mostly for archive and reference purposes. Drying out and uh, preparing the gutted building shelf for the rebuild was a huge opportunity for architectural historians to understand the building better and conservatory stores to conserve what had been uncovered. Um, uh, and particularly 17th century Trompe paintings on the hidden walls of St George's Hall. Various drying techniques were trialled that eventually controlled ventilation of the prevailing southwesterly wind throughout the building proved the most effective long term. The decision on how to rebuild uh, was separated into three approaches, recreation of historic interiors before the fire, as before the fire, recreation of interiors in the spirit of what historical evidence suggested would have been there centuries before, and modern interior architecture using traditional materials and Gothic principles to match with the building. I will walk briefly, uh, I talk briefly about the first approach um, as applied to the devastated crimson drawing room, um, one of the semi-state rooms created by or created for George IV in 18, the 1826 remodel of the castle. Uh, reception rooms. The main reasoning, uh, go for that, uh, this is a, a mid 19th century image of that room or impression of it. The main reasoning behind this approach was that all the artifacts from this room were in store at the time of the fire and that this room would still have its working function as one of the principal entertaining rooms for the royal family in both state and private events after the restoration. The original designs were in, in the archive. Uh, these are originals from the Morel and Seddon who were commissioned for the interior. Um, 
for this room existed and these provided the detail and inspiration of the recreation of the room as it would have been in 1828 when finished. Uh, Moulds and models were created from uh, consolidated and restore fire damaged artefacts um, from which, and this is a wall panel from the Crimson, uh, from which a mass produced uh, architectural detail uh, was made in the same way as the original. In 1826, uh, reinforced lightweight plaster, fiber reinforced lightweight plaster was the new technique and with the exception of silicone rubber molds, um, was again used to uh, replace plasterwork details uh, so the, which were created in the same way. Any remaining plaster details were consolidated in situ, but there was very little. This is a slide of the crimson drawing room ceiling uh, in uh, one corner showing uh, the remains of some of the uh, okay, never mind, remains of some of the uh, original and new plaster work. Uh, the skills were rediscovered and relearned on a massive scale and development of speed associated with the original production methods was critical to the rebuild program. Usually conservators replicate a small part of an object for the sake of visual integrity or interpretation. In this case, it was creating the whole new uh, from a few remaining fragments and information from detailed pre-fire rectified photographic survey. I joined the Windsor Castle Fire Restoration Project in 1996 when the focus was on interiors and particularly for my team, furniture, although we did get involved with fixed woodwork projects and gave advice to contractors where applicable. I have deliberately left out the detailed science behind this dealing with the elements talk because I did not want to steal the thunder of any of the very competent speakers to follow, and I wanted to emphasize the importance of maintaining and conserving the practical craft skills of the production of historic objects as a way of understanding them and their context, and as an important part of informing decision-making in conservation. From what I've seen and read, I feel very sure that conservation is safe in the hands of the next generation of professionally trained practitioners who have been taught all the right questions to ask before they raise a sharp instrument or apply a solvent gel to an object. Thank you for listening to my story and good luck to all in the next generation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian, for this inspiring talk. Um, it breaks your conservator's heart to see ruins like that. And uh, that's beyond any restoration. Um, though the rest reconstruction looks beautiful, and uh, it, it really also gave you an opportunity to learn, uh, relearn all those craft skills. And that's, that's, that's Indeed. amazing. Yeah. Well, let's uh, quickly proceed to our first paper of the day. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, we are very proud to announce Tirza Moll. She's a master graduate from the University of Antwerp, and she now works as a conservator of furniture and ship models at the Rijksmuseum Amsterdam. Her talk is about a very special group of object, objects, and she will talk on the so-called half hull models from the maritime collection of the Rijksmuseum and highlights the provenance and the function of those models. So Tirza, the floor is yours. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Sophie. And um, thanks to all the people that have made this wonderful symposium happen. I think it's very important. Uh, like uh, Sophie said in this presentation, I would like to tell you about the research and the half models of Rijksmuseum's maritime collection. This collection includes over 300 half models transferred from the Department of the Navy to the Rijksmuseum from 1883. A half model is a scale model from the starboard or port side of a hull of a ship uh, mounted on a wooden backboard. Half models are constructed in wood, painted and finished with a transparent varnish. Sometimes a label is attached to the backboard with information on the scale 
name and provenance of the model. We distinguish different kinds of models. On the upper left, you see a bracket model um, indicating the frames. I'm going to show you the frames. Yeah, the frames are the um, vertical ones and the ribbons of, um, of a ship. This type of model makes up more than half of the collection. We see it executed with gun ports. Those are the white squares uh, or without. And right from the bracket model, we see a more elaborate version planked above the waterline. The gun ports are cut out and the back panel is painted. The labels mention the various ships that have been built after this design and illustrate the archival function a half model can have. Models like this make up some 15% of the collection. In the lower left corner, we see a model that is represented by 25%, more or less, and these models are totally planked. The frames are not visible. In the lower right corner, we see the most elaborated version, and these are only there are only a few such models in the collection, and they seem to have had a merely representative function. Despite the great number of half models in existence, little is known about their production in the Netherlands. Knowledge about half models is previously been got, gathered from archival and historical documentation, though such information is scarce. As a result, most of the half models in the Rijks Museum collection cannot be attributed to a specific dockyard, are not associated with actual ships, and have therefore been aside broad production date ranges. Moreover, the function of half models is ambiguous. It is assumed that they played a role in 18th and 19th century Dutch shipbuilding industry, but what role exactly is not defined. The production of half models flourished in the late 18th century, half a century after ship design drawings were introduced in the Netherlands. Until the 18th century, Dutch ships were built without drawings. Shipwrights worked according to a set of proportional rules and their private experience. Uh, sorry, <laughs> and making each ship different. This method had proved to be successful enough until by the end of the 17th century, naval tactics like the line of battle called for predictable and standardized performance of warships. With the introduction of drawings, the design phase was separated from the construction process. Ship design started by drawing the mainframe, that is, um, this one in the middle, a frame in front and one frame in the back. The dimensions of the other frames are derived by a complex geometrical construction. When the design was complete, the coordinates of the frames were collected in a table of offset, like you see in the left lower corner. Um, and the information was transferred to a lofting floor and drawn there in real size. And from this real size drawing, the frames were constructed. You see this happening in the upper right corner. So what would be the possible role of a half model in this process? Was the model used to make a drawing or was it made according to the drawing? And if so, why? So these are the questions we have in this research. The first one is when and where were the half models constructed? And to answer this question, we will perform general chronological research. The other question is what was the function of half models in the Dutch shipbuilding process? And um, study of stylistic features, tool traces and marks, construction um, can give more insight in this question and also a reconstruction of a half model is made. As for dendro chronology, <laughs> um, backboards are an integral part of the half models and they're often made from a single plank of oak. The annual growth rings visible on the sideboards can be analyzed with non-intrusive dendro chronology. The information retrieved is an estimation of felling dates of trees and identification of specific geographical regions. To learn about the function of half models, visual research is performed on each model. We look at stylistic features such as different ways the gun ports are represented, you see them above, or the stems are represented, like you see below. We look at um, marks, tool traces, and construction, and here we focus on signs that can tell us whether the half model is constructed according to a drawing or the other way around. Like I said, in order to gain insight in the methods of construction, a mock-up is made. First, an existing drawing of an 18th century ship is enlarged. The drawing is transferred to wood by placing it on top of the wood and puncture the drawing. The separate parts are shaped and mounted. 
Like we see in the models of the collection, the frames are fixed to the back panel with nails from the back side. The frame should create a skeleton with smooth curves, a fact that will show once the gunnel, you see that one uh, in the right lower corner, the black uh, plank, um, once the gunnel and the ribbons, you don't see the ribbons yet, <laughs> are fixed. The wood for the gunwale and the um, ribbons is bent with heat and humidity. And this process, which as you can see, is not finished yet, but it, it points out where in the actual half model collection we have to look for tool traces and marks. So um, I can share some results with you, all of course preliminary as it is an ongoing research. Um, as for dendrochronology, uh, dendrochronologist Marta Dominguez del Mas has researched 70 half models and the first results are very promising. She concluded it is possible to cluster five groups of back panels that originate from the same tree. We may assume that models within this cluster have been produced at the same dockyard. So if one of the models is attributed to a specific yard, like the one in the right below corner, for example, stemming from, Am from Rotterdam, uh, we can assume that the others have also been produced there. Moreover, once we know the felling dates of these trees, we can narrow the production date ranges. Like in this case, the most recent tree date for the wood of this group of models was 7045. Uh, with oak, we can add at least 14 years to account for the minimum number of subwood rings missing. So this tree was cut after 7068, and this narrows the production date range to 7068 till 1810 instead of 7050 till 1810. As for research about the function of the half model, I will take you through some examples of tools and marks. On almost all the frames, we see scratch lines or pencil marks that indicate the position of the gunnel and the shear line. As you can see, these positions are taken from the backboard of the panel and uh, from the back panel and are transferred with a hook to the outside of the frames. You see that on the right picture. What else do we see? We often see the position of the frame scratched in the back panel. Also, we see punctures in the back panel centered above the frames. And you see these, for example, this one here. One could think of a button positioned here to draw the shear line or to check the smoothness of the curve or to keep the frames in position when they are not fixed yet. I'll get back to that later. On this picture, we also see the tough rail indicated on the back panel. And here, we see the position of a gun hole marked by a scratch line on the back panel. It looks like this position has been copied from the drawing. Also, we notice punctures on the top side of the frames. These indicate quite likely the use of a baton temporarily nailed there to position the frames in the right distance of one another and in the right angle to the backboard. Something still puzzling me is the punctures in the back panel adjacent to the frames. We see them at random heights. The punctures correspond with corroded dents in the frame. So far, I can only think of the model maker using provisional iron nails to position the frames before they are fixed from the backside of the panel. The corrosion must have been caused by iron nails reacting with the tannins in oak and catalyzed by humidity. Also, we find no, most, num no, most frames are numbered and according to literature, you see an example of a number in the frame, they're hard to photograph, so it's not best quality. Um, according to literature, each shipwright had its own way of numbering the frames. For example, Amsterdam, in Amsterdam, they generally started counting from the mainframe to the front in capitals and from the mainframe to the back in Arabic numbers. While in Rotterdam and Zeeland, they counted from front to back in Arabic numbers. So this is quite interesting. On the back of the panel, we see alternative registration numbers written in red or white grease crayon. And these may be indicative for stocking systems at different locations. Regarding this storage, an interesting phenomenon is the holes in the back panels of many models. We see them in different shapes and dimensions. Some holes are even drilled through labels like the one with the white arrow. Some have been covered with paper that is painted over with a wood grain imitation. Often here we see the holes have been opened again. 
We assume that the holes were used to store the models, for example, on metal or wooden bar. And the distances between the holes are noted, I, I mean, I do note them, as they may lead to eventual clustering of models from the same storage. The metal hanging systems may be added later. We notice a great variety in shape and quality. Some are executed quite flimsy and others are very decent. Again, we look for similarities in the actual and former distances between the hangers. Finally, we notice a hole in the mid-frames of many models. The holes are, are around two to three centimeters deep. And if you would imagine putting a stick in the hole, like you see on the right, uh, upper right picture, um, you could imagine it, it would make, uh, it, it would make the, um, <laughs> the position of a horizontal position on a flat surface possible. And um, on the bottom of the consoles, we often find Oh, sorry, we see on the right and left side of the panels, we see consoles, which also um, support this idea of a standing position. And on the bottom of these consoles, we often find cut nails preventing the board from slipping. So this raises the question, why would, why would one like the model to be standing up instead of laying or hanging? Maybe to have it near while discussing or demonstrating it to clients? As for construction, we can distinguish the number of frame, frames used for the model, and literature suggests that each shipwright had a specific number of frames in their ship design. Another distinction is the way the frames are mounted to the back panel. As I just mentioned, in general, the frames are nailed from the back side of the back panel. And in some cases, the frames are positioned in rabbits that are cut in the front side of the back panel. And on the right picture, you see an example of this. We look at um, adjust adjustments <laughs> sometimes made to the construction of the model. And here we see, for instance, the frames are adjusted to fit the shear stroke. The pieces of transfers would have been attached on top of the frames. So the um, making of uh, reconstruction is very instructive. And it shows that the shape of, for example, the gunnel, like the, one, you know, the red lines you see in the upper picture, it, it can't be derived from a drawing. Um, it, the measures and curve have to be determined in the three-dimensional three model. And this is much easier to do on a model ship than on a real size ship under construction. So the use of a model helps to estimate the dimensions of the wood needed for the planking. Well, conclusions. Sometimes you only have more questions than answers once you're halfway research, but I can share some cautious um, conclusions with you. When and where were the half models constructed? If we group the models according to the dendro results and we find one of the models of this group is known to be produced at a specific shipyard, we can attribute models from that group to the same shipyard. Moreover, based on significant similarities, in construction or stylistic features, we may also attribute undated models to this group. And next to that, um, according to the dendro felling dates, we can narrow the actual um, production ranges of the models. As for the function, the question about the function of the models, um, we can assume according to the traces and tool, the tool marks and traces, uh, that the models are taken from the drawings and not the other way around. The models have been used to check if the drawings were correct or if adaptations were needed. And I can imagine that the frames have first been positioned quite loosely, fixed by nails on the side, um, one button on the top and one button to secure the right angle. And now the smoothness of the curves can be checked. Um, and if uh, needed, the frames can be adapted. And only after the design was proven right the frames were fixed from the back with nails and the gunnel, and then the ribbons were placed. Beside this, um, half models have been used, may have been used to show the design to people not familiar with um, reading of two-dimensional drawings. And finally, they may have been uh, used to calculate the dimensions of the wood for planking. So this and future research, um, future results combined with future archival and technical analytical research um, collected in a database should give a more complete picture of the half model collection of Rijksmuseum, but maybe also uh, informative for other half model collections. So that was what I wanted to share with you and um, thank you for listening. 
and I want to thank the following people as well. Yes, no, thank you, Tilda. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Thank you, Tilda. What a beautiful and interesting ship models. What an extraordinary collection. In a way, we will stay with the maritime theme also with the next lecture and go on with the conservation and restoration of everyday objects found aboard sunken ships. I have the honor to announce Max Fulm from the University of Amsterdam. Max is a currently in the advanced professional program and he will tell us about some interesting phenomena occurring on smaller waterlogged wooden objects. Max, here you go. I hope you can uh, hear me. Um, and I hope you can see me now. Yes, we can hear you and we can see you now. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Connects team, for introducing me. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Max Vollmer, and I'm an APP1 student at the University of Amsterdam. Unlike the previous speaker, I will focus on objects that have been kept underwater. More specifically, I'll discuss leaching objects in the Dutch National, National Maritime Collection. I will present to you some of my findings during my master's studies, where I investigated the long-term conservation of smaller waterlogged wooden objects that were treated with polyethylene glycol. So the main point I want to get across is that I managed to identify problematic objects in the Dutch maritime collection using fairly basic tools and that smaller waterlogged wooden objects might deserve more attention from researchers than is currently giving, given to them. But seeing as most of you are furniture restorers and perhaps not so familiar with archeological wood, I will first give you some background information. I will discuss what waterlogged wood is, why it needs to be conserved, and I will tell you something about waterlogged wood in the Netherlands. Then I will present my research to you, including my approach and my findings. And finally, I'll share my conclusions and leave you with some questions to ponder over. Yes. Um, so what is waterlogged wood? When wood becomes either buried in the soil or it sinks to the bottom of a river or a lake, it becomes fully saturated with water. The wood eventually becomes waterlogged. There is no more air present in the wood. When stored in these wet conditions, degradation mechanisms will occur differently compared to wood that is kept above the surface. Though waterlogged wood will degrade much more slowly, this degradation still occurs and it results in a compromised cell structure. Then, when after hundreds and sometimes even thousands of years, this wood is rediscovered, it may appear to be in a perfect condition, but this is not the case. When excavated, the degraded wood cells are internally supported by the water, but as soon as this water starts to evaporate, the wood will start to shrink, crack, and warp significantly. This results in significant damages and is in particular cross-grain checking, as you can see on the images on the right here. Naturally, we want to prevent this, which is why a conservation treatment is needed. The most often used method to consolidate uh, is using a consolidant uh, and most frequently polyethylene glycol is used. This is a waxy polymer and its structure is given on the right. Depending on the chain length of the molecule, which can range from a relatively short to a very long polyethylene glycol chain, uh, it's either liquid at room temperature or it's a solid. solid. Different grades of polyethylene glycol are used depending on the type and extent of degradation of the wood. Polyethylene glycol isn't the only material that's used for consolidation, though. There are also examples where sugar was used or even resins, but this is generally speaking a little less common. There are different application methods, but in the Netherlands, impregnation by submerging the objects in a basin filled with PEG dissolved in water is the most commonly used method. Uh, but the method is rather time consuming and average treatment times uh, take up to two years to complete. These are just some famous examples of waterlogged wood that is found around the world. On the left you see the Swedish warship, warship Vasa, followed by the Viking ships below, uh, found in Denmark. And then for the Germans uh, you see the Bremer Kroge. Uh, and finally, because we also have some English speakers here, I added the Mary Rose. 
The first three ships were discovered in the late 1950s and the 1960s, and not much knowledge was available on large-scale PEG treatments. Basically, the whole VASA was the first large-scale experiment uh, with PEG. So I would label the 1970s as the golden age of waterlogged wood research, where everyone was suddenly in need of finding appropriate methods to consolidate and conserve their valuable objects. In the Netherlands, however, the situation was a little bit different. Backtracking to after World War I, uh, though the Dutch did not fight in this war, there, uh, it resulted in a large scarcity of food. Combined with the flooding in 1916, the Dutch government decided that more farmable lands were needed to provide food to the people. Well, since waging war wasn't a particularly favorable option at that time, uh, instead the government decided to just create an entire new province out of the sea. And this became the province of Flevoland, as you can see here on the left. Now, when digging trenches to provide these farms with water, more often than desired, workers would hit a shipwreck that was buried in the soil. As you can see on this image on the right, uh, many shipwrecks were found. In total, it was over 450 shipwrecks that were discovered. So instead of being able to focus all their attention on one valuable object, there was suddenly this huge amount of cultural heritage in need of treatment. Here on the left, you see an image of a shipwreck during its excavation. Um, so this area used to be water and then turned into soil and then the shipwreck was found. Um, since the Dutch had to deal with this large volume of objects and because knowledge on the conservation of waterlogged wood was still being developed, the first thing they did was experiment with different treatment methods. Around the mid-1970s, the researchers decided on using the basin technique I explained earlier, which they had seen abroad and tweaked a little to their own liking. On the right, you see a worker meticulously stacking a basin, basin full with as many pieces of waterlogged wood as he possibly could. Smaller waterlogged wooden objects would be added last to maximize the use of space. And now I will take you with me 50 years further to the beginning of my research period last year. For reasons unknown to myself, I was interested in waterlogged wooden objects. So I contacted Stichting Erfgoedpark Batavialand, who oversee the Dutch maritime collection, and I asked them, do you have objects that might have conservation problems? I was told that they had a problematic object and I, I should just come by. They then showed me this rather unimpressive dark looking wooden skimmer, but I was intrigued by its problems. Compared to other objects in the collection, this piece, piece looked much darker and it felt sticky. Plus there was a fluid leaching out of this uh, object, which was suspected to be PEG, so polyethylene glycol. Initially, my plan was to research what this fluid was exactly and what was causing it to leach. But then COVID-19 happened and all research facilities were closed. So I rethought my approach and I came up with the following questions. Firstly, I wanted to know if these problems were related to the treatment process. I also wanted to know if other objects might feel sticky. I was wondering if color could maybe be an indicator of conservation problems and if similarly affected objects perhaps shared distinct characteristics. And finally, I wanted to know if it was a group, group of objects that had this problem or if perhaps the entire collection was affected. In doing some preliminary research to see if my reproach was uh, relevant, I came to the conclusion that there was a big difference in my perspective compared to the typical workers in the field. I was looking from the perspective of a conservator or restorer, whereas most literature was either written by archaeologists or chemists. Uh, whereas their research was written during an experimental phase where they were looking for possible treatment methods, I was able to use this established knowledge and look back on what might have gone right or wrong in the past. Seeing as most of the research was focused on larger objects, I really did not find a lot of information about smaller objects, which were the ones that were giving me problems. And what I also found is that most research was focused on the initial treatment of the objects, whereas I was looking at the long-term conservation instead. Finally, whereas those researchers were looking for treatment development and options, uh, I was looking to diagnose a problem. Uh, 
yeah, so I decided to first conduct extensive literature research, which uh, included examining old treatment reports. I also managed to get my hands on old working documents. And then I decided to inspect smaller portions of the collection based on the treatment methods I had found in the conservation reports. I decided to note down the color of the objects, since color was normally mentioned in liter literature only as an object being dark or too dark. I decided to want, uh, that I wanted to have a more scientific approach to this, or at least a more replicable approach. So I used a raw color chart, as you can see here on the right. I also brought my trusty UV flashlight with me to see if there were perhaps interesting findings in the fluorescence of these objects. I also used my other senses. Uh, I felt the objects for stickiness. I looked to see if there were droplets visible on the surface of the objects. I even smelled the objects and I wrote down any other noteworthy findings. So here are some of my results. I uh, found a myriad of colors. You see that all the colors that I registered um, are given here in the slide. And as you can see, this method allows me to more accurately describe an object's color instead of relying on vague descriptions, such as reddish brown or grayish brown. Uh, when I examined uh, objects that had undergone a similar treatment method as the wooden skimmer, I found that they too had conservation problems. Uh, here you see wooden shovel. And as you can see, here's the shovel. Um, there was a brown droplet visible underneath the handle of this object. When I lifted the object from its place, I could see dirty tissue, tissue paper, which felt sticky when touched. Here you see a close-up of the surface of the shovel where you see elevated adhesions, these little things over there. When I inspected the shelf with my UV flashlight, I saw more residue on the shelf than I had seen in regular lighting conditions, which is given here. Then uh, when I inspected the objects, I found that large adhesions um, became visible that had this white greenish fluorescence that you can see over there. I did not assign a RAL number to this color since I did not have a UV color chart. Then on the right, my scientific curio curiosity got the best of me and I poked one of the pools. Instead of being hard and solid like I expected it to be, the surface felt soft and it actually showed a shimmering, wet looking, sticky surface underneath, as you can see here. I then looked for more similarly treated objects and interestingly uh, enough, they all showed very similar problems. These objects looked nearly black and using my flashlight, I again saw droplets covering the surface. Here are some examples of objects with a large amount of residue visible on the shelf as well. Uh, these objects were stored in this location in 2016 uh, in, and in case of this object here with its lid, this object was uh, lent out to a different museum and returned in 2018. Therefore, the leaching that we see and this residue that has formed on the shelf is very recent and has um, yeah, occurred here in the past three to five years, indicating that this leaching is an ongoing process. Here I have summarized the similar characteristics that I found in these objects. The objects share a similar treatment method. They were first rinsed in water, and then they were treated first with this shorter chain polyethylene glycol, uh, that's a PEG 600, uh, and then either a PEG 1500 or 4000, so a longer uh, chain. They shared a similar color. Most objects could be called grayish and brownish black, or more specifically, raw colors 720, 1904, and 1905. All objects had a sticky surface when touching them, and when smelling the objects, most of, most of them smelled extremely sweet. Um, only those objects would, which had been stored in those little plastic bags um, smelled very sour, so assume that this might have something to do with being stored in a microclimate. In all cases, there were visible droplets on the surface of the object, both in visual light and, in, and uh, when, uh, when I use my flashlight. The same goes for the residual matter, both on the object and or on the shelf of the object. The UV flashlight made it possible to see the residue on the shelf, even if it was not visible in regular lighting conditions. Based on the treatment method methods recorded in the treatment reports, I was able to conclude that only a small batch of objects seemed to be affected. 
I even found a source that actually stated that the above mentioned treatment method was an experiment that was stopped in the mid 1970s because leaching was already absorbed, observed back then. This brings me to my conclusions. I would say that I've managed to successfully identify problematic, pro problematic objects based on firstly color and then secondly confirming my suspicions with a UV flashlight. Using the flashlight is essential since the collection also houses other dark looking objects that not stick, leach or have this distinct fluorescence. Only the objects that showed this distinct fluorescence and the dark color were the affected objects. I also managed to conclude that only a small part of the collection was affected and that this is most likely due to an experiment that was conducted in the early 1970s. Naturally, smaller objects are often earlier used for testing because they are of a much more manageable scale. This means that collections that consist of smaller waterlogged wooden objects might be more heterogeneous than conservators might think, especially if these objects were treated in the early 1970s. 1970s. Now, I wouldn't be a proper scientist if my research uh, didn't raise more questions, so I will present some of them to you. Uh, what might be causing these problems? Could you perhaps use a combination of this color checker and UV flashlight as a treatment in the identification tool in case uh, you don't know how an object was treated? Is this leaching phenomenon observed only in the Netherlands or may it also be observed abroad? Uh, and how do we retreat these objects? Is it even possible and should it be done? Finally, should we pay more attention to these smaller objects or since there are so many of them, do we just accept that some might be leaching fluids or be very dark in color? I would love to discuss this with you and I would like to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Max, for uh you're your shining your light in both in both ways on these uh, often overlooked uh, objects very nice talk. thank you um we now have a 50 minute q a session and there are several questions that popped up popped up in the chat box uh, so let's start with our keynote speaker adrian Adrian, can you please unmute your microphone and andreas has a few questions for you Okay. Yes, Adrian. Um, the first question comes from my uh, She asks, did you develop an emergency plan and a risk management after the fire? And she has a second question. Reconstructing the furniture, what kind of coatings did you use? Historic or modern coatings? Right. Uh, in terms of disaster planning and emergency planning, there is a very, uh, very detailed um, and uh, relatively, or, or not relatively, regularly reviewed plan uh, for all the uh, state departments and works of art, um, prioritised um, with uh, particular fluorescent uh, markings as well for UV fluorescence if they, if they need to uh, get in in poor visibility. Um, so yes, so th there, there's a very, uh, yeah, very detailed plan. Um, in terms of uh, the finishes, uh, generally speaking, if there were reconstructions of objects, uh, they were finished as um, closely to the original uh, surfaces as possible. Uh, there is a, an exception to that for anyone who visits um, St George's Hall in Windsor Castle will notice. Um, and that was is a rather unpleasant waterborne acrylic finish on uh, some of the wood panelling there because uh, I believe the um, explanation was they weren't allowed to have volatile solvents on site when they were finishing it. Anyway, <laughs> I hope that answers those questions. Thank you. Uh, there is another question coming from Anna Teresa Schwenzer. Um, were fragments reintegrated into the construction? 
yes, um, particularly um, in uh, some of the fine plaster work uh, where they were viable um, because it was a, a high level fire. If the supporting beams uh, were burnt through and dropped down, sometimes it, it protected uh, some of the uh, original detail because the fire was uh, above it and a lot of those fragments, if they were viable, if they were strong, not denatured by the heat and moisture, were integrated, reintegrated in the remake. Mm -hmm. Okay, a third question. Uh, Angelika Rauch asks, uh, did all the water for putting out the fire cause the growth of fun fungi or insect infestation? Indeed. Um, certainly there were problems with mold and fungi in, in that sort of um, environment, uh, you know, with, with, uh, particularly in the areas below the fire ground. So there were undercroft areas and basement areas and, and lower corridors and things. And um, there was, uh, you know, continual control of mold and, and fungi and that's uh, why I mentioned that uh, in fact um, they tried many uh, engineering uh, uh, methods of, of drying the building but in fact they found that controlled natural ventilation being channeled and by opening and closing vents depending on the wind direction and uh, RH uh, outside, uh, they uh, were able, or humidity levels outside, sorry, they were able to um, uh, dry the building more quickly than expected. Um, originally the assessment was five years uh, to even get it dry before they could build, uh, but uh, in, in fact it dried very much quicker. Uh, but yes, constant problem early on of mold and fungi. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, I think we have some questions for Tirza. Tirza, can you please unmute your microphone, please? Yep. yep. Thank you, Adrian. Um, the first question is from Alma Ben Yosef. Uh, can you explain why you add 14 to the dendro calculation? All right, so I see uh, Marta's in the chat. So Marta, if I'm wrong, uh, please <laughs> write it down. But um, if you want to make an estimation of a felling date of a tree, you can only be sure that you found a felling date when you have sapwood on the, on the board. And in case you don't have the sapwood um, visible, you have to calculate an amount of years extra. And as uh, then in dendronal chronology, they assume that for an a piece of or an um, oak tree of this age, which is I think around 250 years old, it was. Uh, you can estimate like 14 years for that. So then you know that uh, at least the um, the felling date is 14 years more recent than uh, the last tree ring date you found. But there could be even more. Um, there could be more tree rings in between the subwood and your found date. So that's the, the least you can say is 14 years. Okay, thank you. Uh, then a question from Velmut Kreep. Um, are those half hole models typically Dutch? Um, no, not really. Well, um, I think the brackets models, I haven't seen them in, um, in international collections, not that many, but uh, for example, we know in France they didn't really use half models. They even uh, thought they were ridiculous because they were mm -hmm. um, such good drawers in France. They didn't need that. Uh, in England, though, they um, they used in private boat building they used uh, block models like the solid um, half models a lot. In and there they were part of the um, design process. And they also used more decorative models to convince the uh, clients to to um to buy a boat built by that so um 
Yeah, you find them around in in America as well, and maybe even in more countries. But I am not um, that far in my research. Yeah, this this probably also answers Friederike's uh, question: Is uh, did you get in touch with other collections to compare these models? Well, uh, tomorrow I'm going to the Maritime Museum in Rotterdam, but of course the, um, the situation, uh, the COVID situation, doesn't make it easy to travel around and visit uh, storages. But um, it's certainly uh, the idea to do so. Yeah. Okay. Um, then Moritz has the following question: uh, Did health models also? Do, no, did full models? Sorry, also meet those purposes, or do they only serve a decorative purpose? If you can compare them. Um, well, if you mean the, 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 whether they played a role in the, the design process, I think they're um, either used as decorative models or they were used to um, as instruct um, for educational purposes and or to show technical inventions. And also they were sometimes used as artist models for, um, for painters. And you have um, full models that were used in churches as votive um, models. So I think that the, 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 the functions differ slightly. Yeah. yeah. And then I have one more question from Henning. Um, he asks, one of the models had several labels with different names and dates attached. Does this indicate that more than one ship might have been built in the shape of that model? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's why we think they also did, well, they also served an archival function um, by adding another label and uh, sometimes the year um, in which this specific ship has been built, it was yeah, stuck to the back panel. Okay, thank you. So that's <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tilsa. Now we have a few questions for Max. Max, can you please unmute your microphone? Yes. The, the first question comes from Irene Meneghetti. Um, she's wondering if larger objects from experimental phases also have the same issues. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, I, I did want to look at that, but I couldn't uh, because the facility that I visited only houses the small objects and the larger objects, such as uh, larger wooden buckets, are stored elsewhere and I didn't have access to that during my research period, so I wouldn't know. Yeah, what a pity. Maybe later. <laughs> um, Marta Dominguez Delmas, uh, she wants to know, could you monitor if the dropping is still going on? Maybe it happened at some point in the past due to warm temperatures and it is stable now. What is your opinion about that? I think that that's an excellent opinion because that's my follow-up research. Um, so I will uh, try to see uh, what is causing this uh, leaching. Ideally, I would see if fluctuations in relative humidity and temperature might influence these circumstances. Um, so I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Next question from Talia Bokelman. Is the phenomenon of the blackish color of these small objects only on wood found underwater? I'm thinking of other archaeological objects found underwater line on land. Is it preserved the same way? Um, so uh, if I get the question right, please correct me if I don't. Um, it's asking if other objects if it's is it wooden objects or also different materials that to me is not so clear i think it's uh, wooden objects wooden but found object. underwater uh, or under water line that um, that means yeah, just Okay, um, yeah, I get the question. Um, well, naturally, when wood is submerged underneath the soil, you also have ex a lot of extra sediment uh, that gets stuck in the wood, but this also occurs underneath the water, like in a riverbed or something. So um, I, I don't really think that the dark color is specifically because it was uh, treated from the soil. Uh, the objects were all rinsed before they were treated, that is to make sure that most of this excess residue is rinsed out of the objects. 
Okay, Frederike Wettig, she wants to know what about the big ships? Do they suffer also from leaching? And do you know if the leaching leads to a softening of the whole wood? So are the ships moving at the end? Um, this is an interesting question uh, because, um, well, my research specifically focused on smaller objects, uh, but whether the objects are actually moving because of the leaching is something I'm wondering too. And that's something I would like to research further. Um, now that I've established for myself that this is uh, a phenomenon taking place here in the Netherlands, uh, my next step is to reach out to other researchers who also have larger ships in their collection and ask them if they uh, recognize this uh, phenomenon uh, and if it occurs in larger ships as well. Okay, thank you, Max. I hope we got all questions uh, for this q a thank you adrian Lisa, and max and thank you for the interesting questions we will collect the remaining questions and forward them to our speakers so they can have a look to them later now we are going to have a little break of let's say 10 minutes uh, we now have 2015 so at 2025 we will meet back have a nice break and a cup of tea. Bye. See you in 10 minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all had a nice little break. Um, first off, after break is Carla, Hem Carla Helmrich, sorry. And Carla is a bachelor student of the Hochschule für Angewandte Wissenschaften und Kunst Hildesheim, the HAWK. And she will present the results of her bachelor thesis in the specialization paintings and polychrome wooden objects. Her paper is about the treatment of heat blisters in the door of an in the paint of a door from the Rupertsberg tea house. And I wonder whether she will tell us to fight the heat damages with heat. heat? We will see. Carla, the stage is yours. All right, thank you. One second. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, good evening and welcome. Um, today, I would like to introduce you to my bachelor thesis in which I dealt with the consolidation of heat blisters using a fire damaged painted door of the Rupertsburg Tea House from around 1842. A concept is developed for flattening and consolidating the heat blisters. In doing so, the focus is on the subsequent reuse of the door. In order to understand the phenomenon of heat blisters, I would first like to explain their formation. I will then go into the damage assessment of the painted door T1 and talk about the aim of conservation and restoration. The practical part of my work um, will begin with the concept development and end with the two consolidation methods I determined. When determining those, I of course asked myself about an alternative method about which I shortly want to share my thoughts with you. Um, before I dive right into my work, I would like to briefly introduce the term heat blisters. Typical damage phenomena caused by extreme heat can be expressed in the form of changes in color or of the varnish, heavy soup formation on the surface or blistering. For the latter type of damage, the term fire blisters is often used, but the term fire blisters reduces the cause of blistering to the effect of fire and the associated heat. However, other tools such as a lamp, for example, that is too hot or an, an improperly used um, heating spatula can also be responsible for the formation of blisters. For this reason, this damage phenomena can also be referred to as heat blisters, as it is ultimately caused by extreme heat input. Thus, the terms heat blisters and heat damaged are used in this context. All right, um, after establishing these terms, we can start. The formation of heat blisters is shown in the two drawings at hand, as you can see. We have a normal paint setup on a wooden carrier, down here the brownish layer, with layers of primer and paint, as well as a coating or varnish. Extreme heat causes um, thermoplastic softening of the varnish and paint layers. At temperatures above the softening point, the so-called pyrolysis starts. In this process, gases are developed that exert an extremely high expansion pressure on the strongly softened layers and blisters form, as you can see, stages two and three. The persistent heat moves further into the deeper layers and more blisters form. So first up in the varnish layers and then they move deeper. This results in layer separation, stomata, and the bursting of blisters, as you can see in stages six to seven. The elasticity of the paint steadily decreases due to an ever-increasing crust linking. The paint becomes brittle and is no longer possible to return to its original state. In summary, it can be stated that the heat blisters occur between two layers of the paint, either between individual paint layers, between paint and primer, between primer and carrier, or even inside the primer layers. Influencing factors can be the type and quantity of binder and the type of pigments that was used, the layer thick thickness of the painting and the varnish, as well as the material of the carrier. How um, other factors for the formation of heat blisters can be the age of structure and the level, or even the duration of heat exposure. All of these factors determine the layers in which the blisters occur their size, also their appearance. Heat blisters can be found on door T1, showed in, this, in the middle photo here, 
The door it belongs to the wooden interior of the Rupertsburg Tea House in the Palatinate region, so in the western part of Germany. And it is this two-story building, as you can see on the left hand. The tea house was probably built around 1842 and has since been the victim of two fires. The entire wooden interior is painted, as you can see on these two photos, and shows an imitation of wood framed with a mandarin border. Door T1, made of soft wood, this one, um, connects the entry hall with a great hall, so it has a quite prominent place in the tea house. During the second fire, all the doors were outsourced except for the door presented. This door is the only object to show these heat blisters. The rest of the painted wooden interior does not show any blisters. The reason why it could not be clarified. The heat blisters were found on almost the entire surface of door T1 in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, as you can see in these two photos. The separation of layers occurred between the primer layers. The inner space of the blisters were hollow. Some blisters showed stomata or gaps, as you can see here in the surface. Group formations where blisters were linked to each other by flat outlets were also present, as you can see on the upper part down here. For a better overview of the different types of blisters, they were divided into sizes and mapped on door T1 down here, as you can see here. Mm, the size is only determined by the lengths of the blisters. Width and height were almost the same, so they were not taken into account. As you can see, um, most of the door is uh, in the green color, so with the smaller blisters. In order to be able to define a conservation and restoration aim, consultation was held with the owner of the tea house, the Förder Fein Rupert's work. Their aim, their aim is to return um, the entire tea house to its original condition. The focus hereby is on the reuse of the building and its rooms. The tea house shall be made accessible for events and tourists. Therefore, the following aim was to flatten and to consolidate the heat damaged paint and to retouch the defects. The paint had largely lost its adhesion to the ground and the blisters were extremely unstable due to the elevated surface level. Without consolidation, the imitated wood paint would have been lost when using the door. On the basis of published methods for the um, treatment of heat blisters, it is said to make the blisters more flexible and thus flatten them by the use of heat. For this reason, a total of five heat sources were tested. The use of an infrared lamp, this one down here, in combination with a heating spatula proved to be very suitable. The softening temperature of the paint was determined empirically with the help of temperature measuring strips, these ones. They change color when the temperature is reached. They can be placed right on the surface so they actually measure the temperature of the surface and not of the heat source. A flexibilization of the brittle paint could be determined at temperatures between 75 and 80 degrees. However, laying down the blisters alone was not sufficient to ensure adequate adhesion to the carrier. For this reason, an additional consolidation agent had to be used. The consolidation agent had to be able to be used above all in combination with extreme heat. That is, it had to be thermoplastic. For this reason, it was decided on an acrylic the isobutyl methacrylate in solvent. Mm, in order to determine the correct concentration of the agent, tests were carried out on the object. During sampling, it became clear that applying the agent with a brush alone was not suitable for all blistered areas. This was particular, particularly noticeable in the case of blisters that were attached to each other or had no stomata or defects in the surrounding area, as you can see in this part of the photo. Um, the agent, or the problem was that the agent could not get into all the layers. As you can see in figure 13 here, there was a major loss of paint during the flattening process of the blisters. Hence, two different methods had to be developed for applying the agent. For blisters that have stomata on the top or gaps on the surface, method A can be used. Applying the consolidant with a brush. Um, through the gap, the agent can reach all layers and an even wetting takes place. After about a 12 hour evaporation period, 
the area is heated with an infrared lamp. At temperatures of around 80 degrees, the paint becomes flexible and can be flattened with a color shaper and dentist's tool. Follow-up work can be done with a heating spatula. Then, weights are placed on the flattened area and left to cool. The surface cleaning afterwards will be done with a cotton swab and solvent. In contrast, method B is for blistered areas that are particularly large and have an intact surface. Um, they must be treated separately. These areas are first heated by the infrared lamp. A small needle is then used to puncture the softened blisters. After the paint layers have cooled down, a small needle and syringe are used to inject the consolidation agent into the blister. So these two steps are pretty time consuming. <laughs> The surface is then evenly treated with the agent drop by drop. After another 12 hour evaporation period, the blisters can be flattened as, as described for method A. When laying down the heat blisters, um, a slight cratering and wiggling of the paint will appear, especially in areas with large blisters. As you can see here on the left, this part is consolidated and flattened. Um, this is because of the strong expansion of the voluminous blisters with a simultaneously constant carrier size. So um, the surface of the blisters expanded while the carrier was staying the same. When noticing this, I of course was thinking of an alternative method, but had still the reuse of the door in mind. So a possible alternative to laying down the blisters could be maybe the following. Um, the large blisters are left in place and only consolidated on their surface as well as from the inside. However, the significantly elevated level of the blisters would still remain and be extremely vulnerable to punctures or mechanical stress. To minimize this hazard, a plexiglass or a non-reflective gloss with um, distant pieces could be placed in front of the paint. The distance pieces are intended to prevent the formation of microclimate, which would be a great and first medium for microorganisms. But this would involve an intervention in the original substance as the glass would have to be fixed to the wooden support with numerous screws. Another point would be the considerably impair of the visual appearance of the door when using a protective gloss. Since it is the rebate side of the door, Closing it is no longer possible and changes would have to be made to the hinges as well as the rebate of the frame. Due to the required distance between the door and the protective glass, dirt particles can also be deposited on the frame. These would have to be removed at regular intervals and the wooden carrier would be exposed to mechanical stress. Um, the conservation concept that has been developed in my bachelor thesis um, makes it possible to preserve the painted wood imitation damaged by heat blisters. It allows the viewer to experience its original appearance and ensures that the door can be reused as requested by the owner. After finishing my thesis, I explained both methods as well as the alternative to the owner, the Fertafine Rupert Speck. They decided on the consolidation with a flattening of the blisters as stated in methods A and B. After this decision, I was able to realize the concept and treat the door both conservatively and restoratively. As you can see down here. So this was on the left, the before photo. This was after the consolidation in the middle and on the right back at the tea house Rupertsburg after the retouch. All right, um, that was all. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. And I hope this small insight on the consolidation of heat blisters was at you as for me developing the method. I'm happy to answer any questions later. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Carla, for this very interesting talk and for this uh, very nice result uh, we can see here in the picture. Let's move to the next speaker. Next speaker is Deborah Heinrich. She's a the student of the Cologne Institute of Conservation Sciences, and it seems that she is an exotic fish in this pool of mainly wood conservators. Her master project revolves around the questions of preserving raincoats, which are made from plastics. Next winter, she will write her thesis. Deborah, the stage is yours. Hello, thank you for introducing me and good evening everyone. Um, yes, I 
am a student at the Institute of Conservation, as has been said, uh, in the textile department. And uh, being a student of uh, the textile conservation, I've come across modern materials many times, uh, which is why I choose to study them in my master's thesis. And I want to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my project on modern materials here and for organizing this conference. Um, dealing with the elements is the theme of today's session and the objects I would like to present to you are meant to withstand the elements or rather to protect the wearers from them. In the following 15 minutes I will give you a short insight into my ongoing master's project in which I work on the conservation of rainwear made of plastic or more precisely of soft PVC film. Uh, first, I will briefly introduce the objects and highlight a short part of the history which explains their current state. And then in the main part, I briefly outline my previous approach, the dating of the codes and go into more detail about the cleaning experiments and their evaluation, which I carried out to develop a suitable cleaning method for these objects. Um, let's start with the objects. Uh, the German Plastic Museum kindly provided the two objects pictured here for my master's project. Uh, the two differently aged coats are made of soft PVC film, while the older transparent women's coat from around 1950 is already brittle, hardly flexible and yellowed. The approximately 10, ten years younger men's coat is in good condition with only a slightly sticky surface. However, both objects share a part of the history through which they came to me. Both objects were located in the same depot hall at Messe Düsseldorf, which was destroyed in a fire in June 2016. The part of the hall that housed the objects was well protected from fire, so that most of the damage was not caused by fire, but by moisture ingress from water and soot. Uh, since the objects were inspected and dried immediately, further damage was prevented. Nevertheless, there are residues of the water, such as lime and dirt, on the objects. Mm. The damage and soiling caused by the extinguishing water are shown on this slide in detailed illustrations. On the left, you can see a detail of the lady's coat. Since it is transparent, the whitish residues, which consist largely of the lime from the extinguishing water, are somewhat harder to see. The residues are marked by blue arrows. On the men's coat to the right, in contrast, it is clearly visible on the black film where the residues are and that their intensity and distribution varies. As you can see, the moisture has also caused rust to form on metal parts, um, which you can see here, um, which has been pressed onto the film in some places. This is marked by the red arrows. Uh, a green arrow um, shows additionally soiling such as dust and soot. Um, the soiling is not only in the detailed areas I showed you on the previous slide, but is spread irregularly all over the surface of the objects. This is illustrated by these mappings, where areas marked in purple show only larger accumulations of residues and dirt where water run down their coats or coats, uh, yeah, or where coats were pressed up against one another. In addition, rust imprints from buttons on PVC are marked here by red arrows and further soiling by green arrows. Um, the major goals for my ongoing work, therefore, are primarily to clean the cleaning of the coats with suitable cleaning materials, as well as the development of a concept for storage and preventive conservation. So far, I researched cultural history of raincoats as well as cleaning methods for plastics. From this, I developed cleaning tests, which I will discuss in some detail later. Furthermore, I analyzed the material to confirm the assumption that the film is made from soft PVC and researched the material, its properties and aging mechanisms. And additionally, I analyzed the making of the seams. As you see here, the transparent coat is all sewn. Special here is the use of silk as sewing thread, which is contrary to the cheap PVC material and the low cost of these coats. Since there is no label in the 
code, I can only assume that it is a slightly more expensive model, perhaps a designer piece. The seams of the black coat, on the other hand, are all welded. Some are additionally glued. This ob observation was a key to dating. Since welding processes were not used in the manufacturing of clothing until the end of 1950s, the dating could also be narrowed down through the cut. Comparable designs for frame coats can be found in patterns like the ones shown here and in fashion literature. The woman's coat, which probably dates from the late 1940s to the 1950s, is older than the men's coat with the welded seams, which dates from the late 1950s to the 1960s. So let's move on to the cleaning tests. The goal is to evaluate a combination of dry and wet cleaning agents suitable for these objects. In the process, I have limited myself to agents already recommended in the literature. I divided the cleaning tests into three parts. In the first part, I only the dry cleaning agents shown on the right were tested on non-soil test samples. In the second part, which was designed as a swelling test, I tested the wet cleaning agents listed on the right on non-soil test samples. In the third part, I tested all dry and wet cleaning agents combined with each other on soil test samples, whereby the cleaning effect was also examined. In the first two tests, I wanted to investigate the effects of the dry and wet cleaning agents on the material of the PVC film. For the evaluation to be as standardized as possible, I used different measurement methods. Uh, the test samples uh, from tests two and three were too small to use the gloss meter on them. Each individual cleaning agent or combination of cleaning agents was repeated on five test samples. Three measurements were taken before and after the tests on each test sample. And the mean values determined from this were then used for the evaluation. And the evaluation of the individual cleaning agents will then be made from the interplay of the results of the various measurement methods regarding changes in the surface, the appearance and the swelling of the materials. Since I'm currently still in the process of evaluating the tests, I will only give a brief, I will only give a brief insight into my procedure. And I am looking forward to your suggestions and experiences in dealing with such amounts of data and breaking them down into easily understandable and quickly comprehensible graphics or texts. With this slide, I would like to show you just briefly how I get from all the measured values collected in Excel tables via evaluation tables to a result that is as easy to read, as informative and as quickly understandable as possible. The table in the middle is my key to record the observations and mean values of the measurement. This makes it easier to compare the individual cleaning agents. For the evaluation, I have created a color coding in traffic light system. This is to give an overview of the results and allow them to be quickly viewed for the individual properties measured in a table additionally to the text. As you can see in the red frame on the right, the dry cleaning agents hardly caused any changes or negative effects. Here is an example uh, of the evaluation of the first test on dry cleaning agents using the FGIR measurement. The peak intensities of the CH group of the PVC and the uh, plasticizer in the FTIR curves before and after cleaning can be put into relation. From this, the plasticizer index, PI for short, is calculated. The PI shows changes in the content of plasticizer on the surface in percent due to, for example, cleaning. The percentage of the PI refers to the plasticizer content measured before the treatment. The first test was carried out on two different PVC films, one as good as new, the other already slightly naturally aged. In the results, you can clearly see the difference due to this. The cleaning agents cause a decrease in plasticizer on the aged film. 
However, this is very small, less than 1%. Moreover, the results hardly differ in short cleaning time or long cleaning time. In the case of the SNU film, the plasticizer content on the surface remains unchanged. Individual small positive peaks are more likely to be due to residues of the cleaning agents. The decrease in the plasticizer content of the surface, therefore, depends on the condition of the film. For cleaning, it should be considered whether the partial removal of superficial deposited plasticizer is preferable to a surface that may be sticky and attract further dirt. However, it should also be kept in mind that cleaning can promote the exudation of further plasticizer. In order not to base my results on one measurement only, I measured different aspects uh, with the mentioned devices. From their interaction results the final evaluation. And I'm currently still evaluating the cleaning tests and will then clean the objects with the selected media. Since the films I used in the tests are a bit different from those of the objects, I will, I will evaluate my procedure during and after the cleaning. My final step will be to determine and recommend suitable storage conditions for the objects. And uh, now, thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, I'm happy to hear them all. Thank you, Deborah. That was great. Um, next are some uh, poster pitches. And we start with Anna Teresa Schwenzer. Um, she's a bachelor student of the Hochschule für Angewandte Wissenschaft und Kunst Hildesheim. And she will bring uh, again to our attention the conservation of waterlogged wood and what makes waterlogged wood so special. Um, Anna Theresa already paid attention to this subject in her training at the Göring Institute in Munich. And surely she will provide us with some answers. And so, Theresa, please go ahead. Thank you for your introduction. Can you see and hear me? Yes, very well. Yes. Okay, thanks. So I know you already heard something about this before in the presentation of Max, um, but now I want to um, talk about conserving waterlogged archaeological wooden objects with polyethylene glycol and in addition freeze drying under vacuum. So first I want to show you why it is necessary to conserve waterlogged wood in general. Therefore, I have these two photos um, taken at the Mary Rose Trust, um, both scanning electron microscope under the scanning electron microscope. Um, you can see on top, um, it's a picture of well-preserved wood cells um, and underneath um, degraded wood cells. So what happened here is that the due to erosion bacteria or chemical processes, um, mainly the cellulose parts of the cell are being degraded and what's left behind is the lignin parts of the cell. So mainly the, the cell walls, the, the whiter layer you can see here. Um, so imagine you excavate a piece of wood and the surrounding conditions change dramatically. Um, what happens is if you what happen would happen if you try to dry without prior treatment is that the water surface tension would fo force the damaged cells to collapse, um, which then would lead to irreversible shrinkage and the loss of the information it might have carried throughout the ages. Um, the method that's um, quite commonly used is a two-step treatment um, with first immersing the wood in a solution of polyethylene glycol and then freeze-drying it afterwards under vacuum. Um, the freeze-drying process can, um, no sorry, the two-step treatment with PEG um, is made up of first immersing the wood in a solution of molecular 
peg, um, in this case it was 400 in water. Um, the short chain molecules can penetrate deep into the damaged cell structure um, and fill those smaller spaces. Um, later on, you can add a um, higher molecular peg. Um, in this case, it was 4,000. And um, the long chain molecules can brace the bigger lumen. Um, they're not filling, filling them completely, but holding up the structure from within. The freeze drying process under vacuum can very, very basically be broken down into freezing the water within the object and forcing it to sublimate in a controlled environment um, while leaving the peg behind. To illustrate this, I have um, four samples. Um, this was this used to be one piece of branch um, which I cut into four pieces, um, all of the um, same size in diameter as well as in height. Um, the first sample shows um, a untreated, waterlogged object um, which is still wet and has a really spongy texture, is dark in colour as you can see and heavy because of the weight of the water. Um, sample two shows a untreated piece of wood that um, waterlogged wood that was just left to be air dried. Um, you can see that it completely lost its size and form, form or shape. Um, the third sample is uh, treated with PEG, but afterwards just air dried. So um, you can see the PEG already did a great deal, but it um, quite a bit of shrinkage occurred. Um, and the fourth sample is treated with PEG and then afterwards being freeze dried. Um, the white stuff on top is the crystallized PEG, which can just be cleaned off but, um, with the soft brush and you can see that it's a bit lighter in color um, it's quite light in weight as well um, and the lighter color gives it a bit more of a natural finish um, and in this this way it can be stored um, um, in a controlled environment let's say if you want to present it in a museum Yes, uh, the aim of this paper was to um, break down the information about this process um, in a way everyone could understand it. So I hope you did and thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Ana Teresa, for your excellent pitch. Uh, I'm sure there are some questions, but we come back to that later. Next and the last for today, we have bachelor student Moritz Erdmann from the Institute of Conservation Sciences. He's doing his second year at university and currently attends the third term. Moritz is about to present an interesting project, experimental archaeology. He will show how to shape a means of transport or a piece of sports equipment just from a wooden board. So, Moritz, please share your screen and off you go. Yes, just give me a sec. There it is. I hope you can see it. Yes, everything can be seen. Okay, well, then, thank you for having me today. I'm going to show you my latest research regarding my ongoing study project at the Kicks. It's a pair of ski from the early 20th century handed to the kicks for conservation restoration treatment by the Open Air Museum Lindla, a small town near Cologne. Unfortunately, due to the limited presentation time, I'm not able to show you the link between the white coating on the ski surface and its history, but I can surely answer questions about this in the Q&A afterwards. So let us start. The given skis gave an occasion to explore traditional ski making. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, skis were manufactured out of solid wood, preferably ash, hickory, or in the Scandinavian area, birch. There were two methods of producing ski, either industrial or artisanal. In both methods, the wood had to be damped to bend the tip as well as the camber in the middle, as you can see here. 
Um, to allow precise recreation of contemporary production methods, dating the object is essential. This is possible considering different evidence. The mounting bi mounted binding mechanism and its assembly through a slot, which you can see here, are typical traits of skis produced before 1925. The company Gietze, which produced the binding, was found in 1898. In addition, a badge placed above the binding that you can see here indicates that the skis were sold at a sports shop located in Chemnitz and Dresden. Destruction maps dated 1945 reveal that these two shops were destroyed by the end of World War II. Therefore, it is possible to place the skis in the period between the founding of Gietze in 1898 and the end of World War II. With the recreation of the skis, I'm aiming to comprehend the artisanal method to gain a better understanding of the technique and identify its challenges, not only for me, but also for the Open Air Museum Lindlar. In addition, I'm going to examine if a knot hole in the middle of the reconstructed ski appears to be a problem in the bending process. Two different sources from 1912 and 1925 display the typical design and profiles of early 20th century skis displayed here. The profile of the skis at hand correspond to the grooved one displayed here. Uh, here you can also see perfectly how the skis bend, not only in the tip, but in its whole length. And in addition, the slot in the middle is visible. An article in a Swiss magazine from 1937 explains how so-called Fertigmacher, which may be translated as finishers, edit the ski with nothing but chisels, planes, and sandpaper. And based on this information, I created a ski by myself. First, I cut a plank out of ash wood orientated to the exact length and the widest and highest point of the ski, and I began chiseling and planing the surface profile. To manage this, I used the tools mentioned in the Swiss article, as you can see here, which are a jack plane, two curved scutters, chisels, and a mallet. Afterwards, I smoothened the surface using, using sandpaper with different grain sizes. After finishing the raw ski form, I cut another plank into the rough size of a ski uh, because this was my testing object to examine how long the actual ski had to be damped to achieve a satisfying outcome. My steam chamber consisted of a steam cleaner that you can see here and a high temperature pipe usually used for plumbing purposes that you can see here. The inside temperature reached 100 degrees Celsius and the relative humidity around 100%. Unfortunately, the humidity measuring device could only reach about 98% uh, and then showed a big error on the display. However, due to the water which condensed on the inside and flew out of the pressure reducing holes in the back of the pipe, it can be assumed that the relative humidity reached around 100%. After 30 minutes, the testing ski had already reached a state of classification and could be placed with a little resistance into the bending frame. To ensure the best possible bending outcome, I lengthened the damping time to 50 minutes to correspond the recommended damping time per millimeter taken from literature. Thereafter, I clamped the ski into my self-built bending frame, of which you can see a cross section here. So at first I put in the tip, bent it over, and then adjusted it with plywood in the middle. After three weeks of drying, I removed the ski from the frame and it showed that the bending proced procedure was in fact successful. So you can see it here. The camber in the middle is bent as well as the tip. In conclusion, the reconstruction has shown that the artisanal methods of making skis bring up different difficulties. The first one I noticed is that due to the hardness and the very long fiber of the ash wood, the removal of tool marks is very hard. Another difficulty has shown itself in the construction of the bending frame. There was no evidence of measurement to be found, so the whole design was made by eye. However, the knot hole in the middle of the ski has had no negative influence on the bending process and the ski stays in shape. If you are interested in learning more about skiing in the beginning of the 20th century or wood bending, you can find further readings in the bibliography on this site. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Moritz, for this very interesting pitch on your reconstruction of the wooden skis. Uh, we now have a short Q&A session. Uh, again, there are quite a few questions in the chat box. 
Uh, may I ask our speakers to turn on their microphones um, only when we address you? So let's start. The first question from the audience uh, comes from uh, Angelica and is for Carla. Uh, go ahead, Andreas. Yes, Angelica, she asks, um, the flattened blisters look much light. Did the treatment affect the color a lot? If so what can, what can be done about it? Uh, yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry for the last photo. I guess that's why the question came up. Um, the last photo um, was taken on site after the retouch, after finishing the project. So um, it was taken with the phones. Therefore, the color is not in, in true tone. Um, but nevertheless, um, it is a slightly lighter outcome, but only because of the, re um, of the removing of the suit from the um, surface and um, from cleaning as well afterwards. So it is, yeah, light, a bit lighter, but not as light as on the photo. So I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so another question. Uh, Vincent Cattersell, um, is the blisters shape related to the wood grain orientation? For instance, more elongated along the grain? Mm. Um, yes, um, so I found some information about that um, and it was part of my thesis as well. So during the pyrolysis process, um, garces are developed and they consist of almost random bonds with the formation of um, highly volatile gases. So these include carbon dioxide, um, water vapor, divined and undivined degradation products, as well as organic acids. So um, the uh, supplementation took place and the structural, structural integrity decreased as well, of course. But in total, um, because of the consolidation agent, I'd guess that for now a reuse and therefore stability of the paint is possible. Maybe it is good to um, check in the near future again, because um, this method was never done before. I tried it at my best. and. Um, so I cannot say if it was totally successful in 10 or 20 years, of course, but I guess it is a great question for further research afterwards. Okay, I think you already answered one of the next questions, uh, which was uh, what components are um, sublimating uh, when gas forms? Um, yeah, is the wood grained uh, decoration still readable if you decide not to flatten the blisters? This is a question of Sophie. Um, so without a flattening, um, the wooden or the wood imitation paint wouldn't be um, able to or wouldn't have been able to um, read afterwards. So um, it would have been lost, I guess, um, and not as visible as it is now with the flattening. So I think it is a um, yeah, better um, outcome for the object to and it is more readable um, and more close to the original. Thank you. Uh, I have another question for you. It's just mine. <laughs> um, how was the reaction of the t people of the tea house, Rupertsberg? <laughs> Um, they were pretty happy about the result. Um, I showed them um, the test surface, of course, and showed them both possibilities um, to consolidate. And um, they were especially happy about um, the reuse of the door that was possible after um, the consolidation. And therefore, they're happy that the door is back at the tea house and um, that it is readable how it was before. So yeah, they were pretty pleased that I uh, was able to write my bachelor thesis on their tea house, yep. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I'm sorry, thank you, Carla. 
uh, now we have some questions for Deborah. Um, uh, the first one is from Alma Ben Yosef, and she asks um, uh, whether metal corrosion or rust can stem, uh, it can also stem from volatile organic compounds like acetic acid. And did the rust occur first after the fire was extinguished? Um, or was it there before? Yeah. I, uh, I cannot answer the question with certainty because as far as I know, there's no condition survey of the objects before the fire. But I think that the rust and the amount come from the moisture from the extinguishing water, at least by this was strengthened and from the buttons uh, and uh, um, yeah, at least and uh, was strengthened by that and uh, helped to form the buttons and clear form the buttons and clear accumulations on the PVC um, so that they, that they could press off the PVC in this um, uh, clear amounts. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, did you notice a difference between the ten the the um, damage pattern on the transparent and on the opaque black PVC? Did the pigment in the black PVC have any influence on it? Uh, no. So the damage is um, the same. Um, it's just better to see on the black coat. Um, but uh, I hope so. Um, I, I did the cleaning tests only on uh, transparent PVC films and because um, I had no black PVC film for the tests um, and I hope that it makes it doesn't make um, make a big difference uh, uh, for the cleaning uh, <coughs> mediums. Uh, does, so it doesn't react different on the cleaning mediums than the transparent coat. Okay, thank you. That's that's clear. Thank you. Okay, um, let's move to Anna Teresa now. And uh, there were no questions in the chat, so let phrase some questions for you, Anna Teresa, to not leave you without having a question. Um, so what a look at wood is something very special. Whenever it comes to wood consolidation, the question arises where the consolidant moves to and how the stabilization functions in detail. Did you eventually prepare cross sections or wood slices for microscopic investigation? No, I didn't. <laughs> um, I can't Would it really be an option to do so. Uh, it probably would. Um, I guess you could also have a look under the scanning electron microscope if um, if the um, PEG um, penetrates into the deeper layers as well and where exactly in the wood cell. It probably would make more sense to do so under the, the scanning electron microscope, I guess. You'd see more. Okay. <laughs> yes, I have another question. Uh, you described the look of your samples. What is the feel of your samples? Can you explain that? Um, yeah. So the the first one, so the untreated wood, is really spongy. The the samples I had, um, um, I took from a excavation. They did at the um, in Upper Swabia, um, Bad Schossenried, there's a, a really big um, excavation area, um, and it's yeah, the texture was really, really spongy and really degraded, um, as you could see as well from the comparison of the still waterlog waterlogged um, sample um, in comparison to the to the dried one. Um, so there was not really much left inside the the dried sample um, untreated was um, very light in weight um, and sort of porous so um, yeah it could break quite easily um, 
the third sample, um, which was treated with PEG, um, but left to dry, left, left to air dry, um, was heavier and um, I'd say stickier as well because we had the subject before um, with the small waterlogged samples, which are not being freeze dried afterwards. Um, so I would compare the the not freeze dried sample to the freeze dried sample as stickier. Um, and the fourth sample, which was um, um, treated with PEG and freeze dried afterwards, it was very light in weight, um, but also very um, easily easily breakable. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Anna Teresa. And finally, we have some questions from Moritz. Um, first, some technical questions uh, from Henning. Uh, did the bent ski flex back to some extent from the achieved shape after drying? And uh, in addition, uh, did you dry the bent ski in controlled or ambient climate? Uh, yes, I'm afraid uh, I can't answer this question to this point because uh, this is something which is still under examination. I dried the, uh, the ski for about three weeks and uh, I wanted to use the same amount of time to check if the plastificated, uh, uh, no, uh, if the shape I achieved stays in fact in this shape. But to answer the last question, I dried the ski in the workshop of the kicks, which is in fact a controlled climate. So if you, I, I don't actually have the, the data right now, but when I'm the next, when I'm in the, at the workshop the next time, I'm able to present it if you like. Okay, thank you. And then I have two more questions from both Vincent and me, who are clearly from the Low Countries and don't know anything about skis. Um, I was, I was wondering, why does it bend in the middle? Ah, uh, yes, uh, th this is something I actually also had to learn myself because I'm not, uh, I'm also not a skiing person. <laughs> um, it is bent in the middle because uh, you use the skis to move around flat regions in the snow and if the ski was laying uh, on the floor uh, maybe it, it was flat on the on the ski uh, on the on the snow uh, you would just slip backwards so you need the 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 camber or the de deflection in the middle to move around in the snow that makes so sense. Yeah, and, to, to step on. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what purpose? And that's Vincent's question. Uh, uh, what purpose is there? Uh, why is there a groove running along the bottom of the ski? Is that to increase grip or something? Uh, what do you mean? Is, is uh, isn't that the same question as? No, it's not the not the um, not the bend part. But um, apparently, there's a groove. Running oh, along the, the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Ah, I think okay. So. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is uh, just a design question. There were three three cross sections uh, visible, and um, these were just the the three common common surface profiles used at that time. So there are nothing no no technical purposes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again, Carla Deborah. Anna Teresa and Moritz, we will mail you the leftover questions, but we have none. <laughs> this brings us to the end of the second Connex session. I would like to thank again our keynote speaker, Adrian Smith, and a big thank for you, uh, you for all speakers of today. Those were Tirsa Mohl, Max Vollmer, Carla Helmrich, Deborah Heinrich, Anna Theresa Schwenzer and Moritz Erdmann and Moritz Ottmann. We also like to thank our institutes and partners, and not least thank you, the audience, for making this event happen. The next session is presented presented under the title 
state of the art. And we'll start with keynote speaker Alan Higginbotham from the J. Paul Getty Museum. This session will be hosted by Julia Schulz and Henning Schulze. So see you all next Monday, same time, same place. And bye. <laughs>